Welcome to this Ruminant Science Conversation brought to you by Adiseo. Hi there. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Ruminant uh, Science Podcast. My name is uh, Michele De Marco. I'm uh, uh, in Adiseo as a Global Category Manager for Antioxidant Solution. So today I'm uh, very uh, happy to have the chance to talk with uh, Dr. Darren Juniper. Uh, Dr. Juniper is a former associate uh, professor of animal science at the University of Reading in the uh, UK. He is a leading expert uh, all around the world on uh, antioxidant and uh, selenium for dairy cows. So welcome, uh, Dr. Juniper. It's, uh, it's really great to have, uh, here, uh, to have you here today with, uh, with us. So let's uh, talk about uh, selenium and dairy cows. We know that uh, uh, today dairy cows experience increased disease risk at, uh, at transition, uh, three weeks before calving to three weeks uh, after calving due to uh, increased uh, oxidative stress. So can you tell uh, us a, a bit more about oxidative stress, what it is, uh, what causes it, and uh, why it's so common uh, at calving? Thank you, Dr. DeMarco. So, well, what is oxidative stress? Very simply, oxidative stress is a way of saying that there is a, an imbalance between the systemic production or appearance of these things called reactive oxygen species. They're also known as ROS. And the ability of a biological system to either detoxify these reactive intermediates or repair the resultant damage. So as the name would suggest, ROS are highly reactive chemicals that form from oxygen, include things such as hydroxyl groups, peroxides, superoxides, and singlet oxygen. So where do they come from? They are simply byproducts of normal aerobic metabolism, where use of oxygen is involved in a reaction. So as metabolism or metabolic rate increases, so does the use of oxygen and the subsequent production of ROS. I should point out at this point, though, that a certain amount of ROS are actually necessary for normal bodily cellular function, as they serve a crucial role in cell signaling, communication, as well as a role in protecting the body from invading pathogens through the action of phagocytes, which engulf and digest harmful particles, um, such as dead cells, bacteria, or foreign particles. However, uncontrolled production of ROS, coupled with inefficient elimination leads or results in this elevation of ROS, um, these reactive oxygen species. So if we could move to the first slide, please. So looking at the first slide, what we have here is um, we have propagation. So propagation would be where um, oxygen peroxides, hydroxyl groups are produced through metabolism. So one of the downsides of these uh, reactive um, uh, particles is that one, they can covalently bond or chemically bond with things such as proteins. So that can create DNA damage. You do not really want damage to DNA. Um, it could just damage protein itself, which might lead to misfolding. And if you have misfolding, then enzymes don't work properly. Um, another consequence can be a pro-inflammatory response. Um, the uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, that can lead to um, the production of this hydroxyl radical we have here. Uh, this attacks lipids, um, polyunsaturated lipids to be precise, which things such as cell membranes are made of. So basically you have this initiation where the hydroxyl group basically rips the hydrogen from the um, unsaturated fatty acid, um, where you actually have this gap, it reacts with oxygen. So you have a lipid radical becomes a lipid peroxyl radical. Once you have this lipid peroxyl radical, um, it can um, further uh, become a uh, lipid hydroperoxide, which can react with other uh, elements. So you get lipid radicals, aldehydes, and other reactive products. Um, and that lipid peroxyl radical itself can actually cleave the, um, hydro the hydrogen from another polyunsaturated fatty acid, and you get a chain reaction. So the cycle continues. Um, so, the aldehydes, particularly the um, bioactive aldehydes, of which malondialdehyde is one example, these are considered toxic messengers. And they, as I've said already, can covalently bond or interact with proteins and either modify the protein or modulate or modify their function activity. So as you can appreciate, changes to how a protein or a lipid function within a living organism can have quite a profound array of consequences for both the animal in terms of its health and welfare, 
as well as its productive efficiency. So why does oxidative stress manifest itself around the time of carving? Well, as you can imagine that as the calf develops and increases in size within the uterine environment, it places an ever increasing metabolic load on the dam. And in this periparturant period, not only is the developing fetus placing ever greater demands on the dam, but the dam is also committing resources to sustain its offspring in that postpartum period. So in modern high yielding dairy cattle, this problem is probably more exacerbated as she would have been the product of intense genetic selection for productivity and efficiency traits. And that will impact or increase the animal's metabolic rate. At birth, there will be some significant endocrine changes, changes that will have a marked effect on the animal's physiology, how she partitions her resources and her immune response. Um, following birth in that postpartum period, a high yielding dairy cow will go through a period of negative energy balance in which she will mobilize body reserves. So mobilization of these reserves can result in increased circulating concentrations of things called non-esterified fatty acids or NEFAs or beta-hydroxybutyrate. And both of these have actually been linked to immunosuppression. So ultimately, the animal's inability to adapt to these changes gives rise to this range of conditions which are classed as transition cow diseases. Back right. to you, okay. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting indeed. Huh? So can you tell us uh, a bit more about uh, uh, the link uh, which is associated between uh, those uh, diseases that can happen around the transition period and uh, the oxidative stress? Yeah, so oxidative stress can affect the animal health either directly or indirectly. So as previously mentioned, oxidative stress can result in peroxidative damage to lipids and proteins. And these are what are known as direct effects. So these direct effects can then affect cellular membranes and components, which may subsequently alter metabolic pathways, resulting in altered physiology, which in turn may result in the manifestation of either metabolic or infectious disease. The most common health problems associated with oxidative stress are usually a consequence of impaired inflammatory response. And the most economically important of those include metritis, laminitis, and mastitis. So metritis and mastitis involve invasive pathogens and the ability of neutrophils to migrate to the site of infection and kill invading pathogens allows the infection to become established. And there is an established negative correlation between disease severity and mature neutrophil number. It is likely that this dysfunction inflammatory response is not necessarily a consequence of just oxidative stress, but rather an inadequacy of micronutrient provision in particular micronutrients known to serve both a physiological as well as an antioxidant role. There is a body of published evidence that demonstrates that some of these micronutrients seem to play a direct, albeit undefined, role in the immune response. It could be that a lack of these micronutrients not only compromises the immune response, but also exacerbates the issue of oxidative stress. So it's more of a question of what is the cause and which one of them is the consequence. Metritis, mastitis, and laminitis clinically manifest themselves and are known to impact carving interval, other health, and productivity. And the financial cost of this has been quantified by a number of authors over the years. What we tend not to notice are the subclinical health problems, health issues that have no physical symptoms but might negatively impact carving interval, animal performance, and animal health, which in turn could impact financial return. These two may be a consequence of oxidative stress or equally inadequate micronutrient provision. And because they are subclinical and maybe more widespread, they're less noticed and much of research may only come to light during a more detailed examination of the herd, i.e. something like routine biochemistry. Yeah, I see, I see, thank you. And, uh, you know, we also know that uh, within, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, micronutrients and uh, antioxidant, uh, selenium plays indeed a, a very important role uh, coping with the uh, oxidative stress. Can you walk me through uh, what is involved here? I mean, why selenium uh, plays this important role uh, for this uh, matter? Well, I can certainly do that. So the role that selenium plays in dealing with oxidative stress is mediated by these special proteins, they're called selenoproteins. Uh, and these are proteins that have what's known as a functional selenocysteine core. So when we move back to my slide here, so um, 
what we have here are two salomized amino acids. Um, so salinoproteins should not be confused with something called a selenium containing protein, um, which tend to contain other forms of selenium. So salinoproteins contain selenocysteine, um, selenium containing proteins will contain selenomethionine. Selenocysteine is unique in that there is no free selenium or selenocysteine pool in the body, as there might be for other amino acids. Um, but it's rather produced to order by a specific genetic sequence, and it's often called, or this sequence is called a selenocysteine insertion sequence. The selenium source for this can either be dietary or from an endogenous um, selenium pool, so from mobilizing body tissues where selenium has become incorporated. Um, there are to date 25 selenoproteins that have been identified, and the group known as the glutathione peroxidases are primarily involved in oxidative protection. Hmm. So I've listed um, one to six there, but glutathione peroxidase or GSHPX1 is the most abundant form and it's found in the cytoplasm of all mammalian tissues and its preferred substrate is um, hydrogen peroxide. Um, glutathione peroxidase 4 is also intracellular, but it's usually found at much lower concentrations than glutathione peroxidase 1, and it has a preference for lipid hydroperoxides, and as such is protective of cell inner membranes um, and other lipids. Glutathione peroxidase 3 uh, is extracellular, and it's typically found, or it's fairly abundant, in plasma, which is found in blood. Um, so, uh, how does it uh, help in protecting against oxidative uh, stress? So moving on. So this is the slide which um, I referred to originally, which showed um, the impact of oxidative stress. And the role that selenium plays is in fairly specific pathways. So the role of selenium in the form of glutathione peroxidase, um, it can reduce uh, hydrogen peroxide um, to water through a series of catalytic steps. And by reducing hydrogen peroxide to something which is relatively harmful, harmless, I should say, rather than harmful, uh, harmless, which is water, um, you no longer have hydrogen peroxide. Um, and then it reduces this production of this free radical or this hydroxyl radical, which is involved in the um, initiation of lipid radicals. Um, at the other end of the pathway, so glutathione peroxidase 4, which is known to react, or its favorite substrate are lipid hydroperoxides is it converts these lipid hydroperoxides into stable lipid alcohols. So they're no longer harmful. They no longer act like lipid radicals, formation of aldehyde. So the, the detrimental impacts of those are, are less prevalent. Um, I have also included in here, although they're not selenium specific, is that the roles that vitamins E and C actually play in its oxidative pathway, as they actually interact with a lipid peroxyl radical and convert that into what's known as a stable vitamin radical. So you can see that the antioxidant defense is a combination of micronutrients. So um, what I would like to point out um, is that the slide I put there is the specific role that selenium plays in antioxidant defense. What I think we also need to acknowledge is that this slide doesn't acknowledge um, the other actions or functions of the other 20 or so selenoproteins that um, are really quite important in maintaining the health and productivity of high yielding dairy cows. Yeah, very good. Huh? It's, uh, yeah, I like, I really like your, your simple way and concise and uh, of explaining these uh, sometimes complicated uh, topics. You are a really good teacher eh? and they are always learning a lot when I'm uh, listening, uh, listening to you. Yeah, that's uh, very good. Thank you. So now, you know, when it comes to uh, selenium sources uh, or selenium products, we know that uh, they are not uh, uh, all equal in terms of uh, bioefficacy. So help uh, us to understand uh, why it's uh, very important to supply our animals, in particular transition cows, with the organic selenium, and in particular with the uh, hydroxyselenomethane or selenomethane. Okay, well, I suppose that it would be sensible to look back briefly at the history of selenium, which I will add is not always been good. Um, up until about the late 1930s, it was always considered to be something very much an element to be avoided due to its very toxic properties. However, that did change when sort of later research highlighted a need for dietary selenium, especially in areas where you have selenium deficient soils. 
The need for dietary selenium was met at that time by the use of selenium salts, and they were typically sodium selenite or sodium selenate. So although these sodium salts met a need, they themselves are quite toxic, and they're not utilized particularly well, especially in ruminant species. However, organic forms of selenium, in which selenomethionine is the predominant selenium species, um, the um, selenium is typically significantly less toxic and it is utilized much more effectively. Um, so one aspect of better utilization uh, in ruminant animals is that selenomethionine is not degraded to the same extent as selenium salts in the rumen. So I'll refer to this slide here. So this is some work that has been adapted by a, from an author known as Galbraith. Uh, so basically, uh, a very simplistic overview is that both sodium selenate and sodium selenite are reduced in, in the rumen by the microbes that are there. So sodium selenate is reduced to sodium selenite. Um, sodium selenite can undergo further reduction and it forms elemental selenium. And elemental selenium is unavailable to the animal. It basically just passes through the animal and is excreted uh, in feces. Um, some of the selenite uh, can go through a reduction pathway and can be incorporated, some of it, into microbial protein. Whereas selenomethionine, so selenomethionine 2, uh, it is subject to some form of degradation, but not anywhere near as much of the degradation that you might find for the selenium salts. So one of the pathways is for selenomethionine to be directly incorporated into microbial protein or washed through into the lower digestive tract. So what we know um, from the various authors is that when you actually look at the selenium content of rumen flora, is that um, selenomethionine is four to five times, or you get four to five times the response than you do when you're using selenium salts. And that's actually um, the reason for that when you look at the, the lower uh, graph here, is that um, where you 75% of selenite is reduced in the rumen and made unavailable to the animal, only about 20% of selenomethionine is degraded to that same extent. Um, so all that selenium that actually then passes through the animal, which is actually made available to the animal. Um, this is a, a slide that I've used time and time again, uh, adapted from Margaret Raymond. But basically, if you take the dietary sources, once they pass through the rumen, um, the inorganic sources, um, for those to be utilized, they have to pass down this selenide pathway. So once they go down this selenide pathway, they're either used for the production of these selenoproteins, and that which is not used is um, methylated and then excreted from the body. So it's either used or it's lost, it is not stored. In terms of organic sources, so for organic sources, they can be comprised of either uh, lots of selenomethionine or a fraction of selenomethionine, and very simply, is that selenomethionine, it too has to pass through that selenide pathway. But where it's, um, where it's not used is that some of it can be non-specifically incorporated into body tissues. Uh, selenocysteine, selenocysteine that can also be classed as organic, but that can't enter directly into selenoprotein synthesis. That too has to pass through the selenide pathway, but it cannot be stored it will either be used or excreted. So selenomethionine is the key. And this selenomethionine pool is really quite important. <clears throat> so when we actually look at this, this non-specific incorporation of selenomethionine into body tissues is of paramount importance in protecting animals from oxidative stress. Firstly, it provides an endogenous selenium supply that can be utilized for selenoprotein expression or synthesis during times of nutritional deficit. So I have a, a, it's a very rough and ready extrapolation of animals that have received organic selenium sources, selenium sorts or control. Uh, and this is in the post supplementary period. So the hatched red line represents the line which you don't really want to drop below in terms of glutathione peroxidase activity. Um, and what you find is that in the control animals, the no selenium supplementation, they're sitting below that line. In animals that received uh, selenite, as I say, it's an extrapolated line. What you find is that maybe you get about 100 days before you hit that danger zone. But for those that have received organic forms where selenomethionine is the predominant source, 
is that's extended to about 175 to 200 days. So actually you get double that, that form yeah. of protection. Um, the other thing that is quite important is that um, we know that the mechanisms that affect this glutathione peroxidase activity, they're not just affected by the selenium status of the animal, they are actually upregulated during periods of increased oxidative stress or potential. Uh, and this upregulation is independent of selenium status. So it'll go up regardless of what selenium status the animal is in. But the ability of that glutathione peroxidase system to respond to that stimulus is selenium dependent. So I, I sort of move on to my, my next slide. Um, and this is just an example to show. So along the uh, x-axis, what we have is a peroxidizability index. So the risk of lipids peroxidizing. And this is based on their level of unsaturation. So when you look in animals that have received either selenium or not received selenium, is that they both have similar uh, peroxidizability index. But animals that have selenium that are able to respond, you'll notice there is a linear increase in glutathione peroxidase activity with ascending oxidative risk. So this is just a demonstration that actually you require that selenium to meet that requirement when animals are under some form of oxidative pressure. Yeah, that's, okay. uh, yeah, that's uh, thank you. Eh? <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Juniper, um, today we know that, that there is a, a new form uh, of uh, organic selenium uh, available in the market, hydroxyselenomethanin, also known as a uh, uh, siliceo. Could you please tell us uh, uh, what it makes uh, this uh, form unique, as well as when and when and how we should feed uh, this uh, hydroxyselenomethanin to, to our animals? So numerous studies have shown that the responses that you see to different selenium sources tends to be a function of the selenomethanin content, or more specifically, the selenomethanin intake of the animal. So if we take other organic forms such as seleno yeast, they comprise of a number of selenium compounds. They're not predominantly, or they're not entirely selenomethionine. So um, this selenomethionine content that seleno yeast have, it can vary between yeast species, it can vary between yeast batches. So there's a, a significant degree of variation between them. And this variability is, as I said, is it, it, probably strain or fermentation process. Uh, it's silicio, 100% hydroxyselenomethionine, which is converted to selenomethionine. Um, so as silicio is not a product of a fermentation or biological process, but rather standardized chemical synthesis, tends to be far more consistent than other organic forms. So with respect to when and how it should be fed, so high yielding dairy cattle are metabolically active 365 days a year. So even if you have a 365 day calving interval of which 305 days could be in milk, the remaining 60 days dry and not really time off at all. But the time when the metabolic demands placed on the dam by the calf are actually increasing. And studies have shown that it takes roughly six to seven weeks for a selenium deficient animal to maximize or optimize its cold blood glutathione peroxidase activity. And this is true of most large farm animal species since erythrocyte turnaround is about seven, six to seven weeks. So if the focus is nutrition just within the transition period, then you would need to begin supplementation at least seven weeks before the start of this transition period. In terms of what you can feed, well, legislation actually dictates how much selenium can be included at a maximum within dairy cow diets. And the current US legislation limits selenium inclusion to the 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of dry matter. Research though has shown that, um, that even at slightly higher doses than that, you still get continued dairy cow responses in terms of glutathione peroxidase activity. Um, and those are slightly higher doses than those that are actually allowed, but they cannot legally be fed. So in terms of how much you can supplement, well, supplement up to permitted levels. Right. How we would offer this supplement, sorry, I'll just go on because this can affect things, is um, that how you offer it will affect how well it's utilized, how well it's taken up. So if possible, you want to feed your supplement through a TMR, you get a better response rather than feed it as a, a, a mixture fed on top of concentrate, which is called top dress, uh, better to feed it in a TMR. 
All right. So thank you, Dr. Juniper, for taking uh, you know time to join uh, to join us for this uh, nice discussion. I have uh, really enjoyed talking with you uh, about oxidative stress and uh, how to mitigate it uh, by using uh, hydroxyselenomethionine. Uh, it's uh, always great to have uh, this discussion with you and to profit of uh, all the insights that you are able uh, to provide. So for all the audience, if you want to know more about uh, uh, Celiceo, Hydroxyselenomethane and the other uh, product in, the, in our portfolio, do not hesitate to visit our uh, website, adiseo.com. So thank you very much for attending this uh, podcast. This concludes today's Ruminant Science Conversation brought to you by Adiseo. 